Chapter 10 The Hardest Winter The road had a familiar feel to his feet. As he walked, Joe reflected that the road, any road, had become an old friend to him. Whether woodland trail, dirt, or cobbles, the road always led to another place, a new start. He thought about his condition and, surprisingly, was pleased. He knew that he had eaten well, was healthy and strong, and still had heavy silver bouncing against his thigh. Girded with these as armor, he went forth to face winter and the white man's world. He walked until the waters of Arthur Kill stopped him, then followed the shoreline until he reached a spot that must have been near the present outer bridge crossing. There, two trees saw a man sitting in a partly hidden rowboat. His gun suggested duck hunting, but all that Joe saw told him no ducks would come to the spot. He waved, and the hunter waved back, motioning him over. As Joe approached, the man said something about not worrying about scaring the ducks. He hadn't seen any. The boy looked up at the clouds overhead and noted the wind direction. He squinted at the New Jersey shore and saw a small cove with tall bulrushes round it. He knew, by an instinct deep in his being, that no duck would fly under such low clouds to sit near a windward shore. He remembered the lessons his father had taught him at Turtle Cove and Vagabond Bay. Two Trees, the Indian, pointed out these things to the hunter. They were a part of his heritage. It was bits of knowledge such as these which had provided food for his people, long before any man had hunted with a gun on this continent. He visualized the fall hunts at Turtle Cove, near his old home that his father had told him about. The men would hide in the tall reeds, reeds like those across the water. In this cove, he thought, would be ducks, feeding and gathering together. Joe offered to do the rowing if the man would come across to look for the seabirds. He told the hunter that he needed a way to cross anyhow, and would pay him for the use of the rowboat. The hunter, still a bit skeptical, finally agreed. Two trees pushed the small boat off a sod bank and into the main flow. The wind kept trying to force the two back into the frothy surf. Once he got the feel of the oars, though, the boat moved off into the wind. Soon the boy had established a rhythm, and the boat moved well. At each stroke, the bow would push into the whipped waves and throw up a fine mist of cold water. Joe felt, and took note of, the chilly bite in the early winter wind. Soon, he knew, would come a tracking snow. This was what his father had always called the first white powder of winter. This was the snow that showed footprints of animals that had eluded him all summer. When the tracking snow came, he could follow them right to their lairs. Joe directed the boat toward the left side of the cove he had spotted. Soon the boat was near enough to see into the protected water. Ducks were there. Scop, black ducks, canvasbacks, and many others were rafted near the head of the tiny bay. The hunter was pleased and amazed. This young boy had been able to point to the spot from the other shore, and he had been right. Joe rowed the boat onto a bank and pulled it up a short way. The hunter pulled off his leather boots and rolled up his trousers. The two waded and crawled to a spot on the edge of the bulrushes. The sound of gunfire shook the reeds. The hunter had time to fire and reload several times while the ducks unaware of the men and only frightened by the noise, still milled around the cove. With each salvo, more ducks dropped to the water's surface. When the last birds had flown off, ten remained to be collected. The two men took their boat and rowed into the cove. Gathering the birds, 
They set out for a clear landing and came ashore on a pebble beach with trees just beyond. Joe offered money to the man for his passage, but it was refused. He told Joe that God had not put the water there to make him a rich man, but had quite possibly sent Joe to teach him about duck hunting. The two laughed together, comrades of the hunt. Joe was pleased at the mention of God. These people of the woodlands were still close to the Great Spirit, he thought. Joe gathered sticks of wood and, twirling a pointed twig into dry pulp, had a fire crackling in minutes. The exhilaration of the hunt, combined with the clean tang of autumn air, had produced fine appetites. Two fat ducks turning on green wood spits became meals of both quantity and quality. It was good to sit once more by a campfire. The young Indian felt his thoughts move through the mists of many seasons, back to other fires, other places. It was comfortable to let the warmth of the embers and the conversation bring back old, buried feelings. Joe pushed back the comfort and warmth by reminding himself consciously that this was now, not then. Many problems confronted him for which he had only vague, half-formed solutions. He was only partly aware that some of these problems were such that he had not even conceived of them as yet. Better, he thought, frankly to ask this man, who was still partially in his debt, than leave and lose the small chance for advice. Joe told the hunter a bit of his story, carefully avoiding any reference to his use of the flint knife in self-defense. He asked how he could make a place in this new white world. The man thought for a time and finally suggested that Joe might find small, odd jobs at the many farms that stretched across the state of New Jersey. Farmers would probably offer food in return for wood chopping and other work. In this manner, Joe could work his way across the state into the Pennsylvania country where, it was said, new coal fields were opening. These mines would certainly need all the workers they could get. Joe knew little of coal. He remembered that some stores in the city had burned it for heat, and it was black. The hunter explained it was dug from deep underground, and only a strong back was required. Having that prerequisite, Joe decided to go to Pennsylvania and try coal mining. It was late now, and the man said he must be going home. Joe was sorry to see him leave. He watched as the wind pushed the small boat back towards Staten Island. This seemed as good a place to spend the night as any other, so Joe gathered reeds and pine boughs for bed and shelter. Soon he was lying in a lean-to, peering into the depths of a tiny fire. The wind whistled overhead, but he was comfortable as he needed to be. In the mellow firelight, he reflected on his experience with the strange white men. Some had been bad, some had been kind, others indifferent to him. He thought it strange, though that none had hated him as his father had said they did in the old time. He re recollected the workers' laughter as they said, Indian Joe, Indian Joe. The laughs had been cheerful, not malicious, as if directed at a foe. Gradually he saw the reason. He was no longer the enemy, as his people had been perceived in the old time. He was only an oddity, a freakish being from another time. Morning came, still and bright. During the hours after midnight, a light sprinkle of snow had changed the hard contours of rocks and trees into softly rounded curves. The wind died before sunrise, and now the world glittered with cold majesty. The snow, thought two trees, was a garment of great beauty sent to the Earth Mother by Tichi Manitou. It must have been a robe of light such as this that she had worn during her descent from the floating island in the story of the beginning. <laughs>
but such thinking could not help a would-be coal miner. Now it was time to move on. If he couldn't find his way to this Pennsylvania before frigid north winds locked the earth in its frozen chains, he'd better have a suitable place to lay up until spring. Joe packed his things and set off from farm to farm, as the hunter had advised. Here he dug, or there he chopped. He was allowed the use of wells and haylofts along his way, but soon saw that he could provide better for himself than the meager rations offered in return for a day of hard labor. One morning he crossed a narrow, ice-bound stream. A thick grove of pine stood on the northern bank. Those trees would break the cold wind. No farms were nearby. Cattails and bulrushes grew where a beaver dam had created a small pond. By dusting snow from the ice, Joe saw through to the stream bottom. He noticed several dark shapes facing into the current, undulating slowly back and forth. Trout. This would be the winter place. Roots, fish, and rabbits from the brush along the banks would serve well until warmth brought back berries and fruit. Branches were bent to form a round-topped framework. The frame was thatched with reeds and bark. The chinks were plugged with mud and clumps of uprooted grass. Inside, the floor was covered with hastily woven reed mats. Soon, a fire sent plumes of thin smoke to the center hole in the roof. The wigwam was ready. A short walk upstream disclosed many rabbit runs trod into the dry grass and undergrowth. Branches were soon cut with a flint knife, and a line of snares set. The rabbit fur would not serve as well as bear skin, but patched into a blanket, it would keep one warm on a cold night. The flesh would not be venison, but it would still fill a hungry belly. Surveying his work, the Indian nodded, satisfied that all was done well. He set out and walked in a mile-wide circle. Exploring the land served many needs. By the time Joe returned to the new wigwam, he knew where he could hide nearby, should danger threaten. The lack of boot prints in mud or snow reassured him that no white man lived near this place. The marks of animals told which species lived here and in what numbers. The place had a good feel to it. He entered the hut and poked the coals back to life. This night's fare was only roots, but the snares, he knew, would soon improve his diet. Two trees set several deadfalls around his hut. These were logs balanced against nearby trees and set with trip lines. They would announce any visitors. This done, he retired to the warm hut. Joe felt something near pleasure as he sat before the tiny flames. Shadows danced across the floor and walls and he had a sensation of being in the company of his own kind. Closing his eyes, he imagined hearing the deep snore of his father's breathing and the gentle sigh of his mother. He knew these sounds to be only wisps of the mind, but they pleased him. It was a long time before he could force his eyes open again. When he did, a subtle difference in the wind sound attracted his attention. He noted that the wind had turned and now blew from the northeast. Joe opened the flap door and stood up in the dark shadows to gather more weather signs. The moon still shone as it had earlier, but the half-orb cast a different light now. It was pale, almost sickly. Around the pale body shone a circular halo. The maple branches that two trees cut that day had poured out sap, and it was now frozen into long icicles. Fingers of grayish cloud were climbing up from the east, obscuring the stars. The Indian knew that snow was coming. 
This was not to be a tracking snow, but the kind that comes on strong wind to pile high and keep one in his wigwam. This was not the time for sleep. He cut branches and reinforced the windward side of the hut. The wind-to-be could easily rip away the thatching before a protective layer of snow covered it. When he was satisfied that the wall would hold up, he thought about his rabbit snares. Better to check them now, by moonlight, thought Joe, than lose them in the coming snow. Checking each, he retrieved two rabbits. These were already frozen stiff. He tripped the other snare so no rabbit might be trapped and not found to be used for food and blanket. Then Two Trees took a last look around and, satisfied that he had done his best, entered the hut. He could sense something in the air. Any modern weatherman would have said the barometer was falling rapidly, but Joe knew only that the air felt wrong. Within one hundred feet of the young Indian, others were also dimly aware of the change. A great snowy owl had come down to New Jersey to escape the Arctic winter. It perched above the wigwam, high in a pine tree, and nervously awaited the storm. A tiny kangaroo mouse, affected by the dropping air pressure deep in its subterranean nest, stretched his long hind legs in dreamless sleep. The beaver, ice-bound within his wooden lodge, gnawed thoughtfully at a bark-covered twig. Rabbits huddled together, gathering warmth from the many bodies in their underground labyrinth. Near the owl, a gray squirrel had rolled himself into a ball in his nest, tail acting as a blanket. The seeds and nuts inside his home of tight-woven twigs and leaves would make trips to the ground unnecessary for the time being, but if the nest was blown down, it could be a sad event for any squirrel. Joe thought of his father's name for this animal. It had been Hannock. He was cheered by the sudden memory. All of nature was waiting for some event that none had experienced before. Each felt the impending menace and knew it would be bad. Most of the woodland creatures had lived only a year, two, or three at most. Even the boy, in his short life, had not yet known a blizzard. Joe checked the inside walls of his shelter and plugged small drafts with grass. He wrapped himself in reed mats and placed a small log on his fire. Having done all within his power, he left the outcome to his god. By midnight the wind had risen to a steady wail. It increased during the early hours of the morning, and by dawn a fine snow was being pushed before it. Through the day, the wind-whipped snow became so heavy that visibility outside the hut was all but non-existent. Toward midday, two trees went out to gather more wood. He saw that the storm might keep him imprisoned for a time. Wood meant fire and warmth. He had to push snow away from the entrance flap. It had already drifted to a depth of two feet. When he finally was able to squeeze through, his senses were assailed by an experience he had not had before. The wind raged and pooled at his clothes. The air was so cold that it hurt his chest when he inhaled. The driven snowflakes struck his bare hands and face with such force that each felt like a tiny needle driven into his flesh. His first impulse was to retreat back into the temporary sanctuary of the hut, but years of forest life forced reason to prevail. With no fire, the hut would soon only offer the prospect of a cold, lingering death. He pushed through drifts and pulled at each exposed branch or twig. Joe cursed his carelessness. The extra wood should have been gathered before the storm had reached its full fury. Instead of trapping rabbits, he should have gathered the fuel to make warmth and light. Hunger could be endured for many days but cold was an insidious killer.
It could creep into the hut by night and invade the sleeping body. Without fur blankets to hold the body heat, Joe knew that fire was more than a luxury now. He gathered what wood he could, but the cold soon forced him back to shelter. During the remainder of the short afternoon, he made several forays, and every twig still visible went into the hut. But on his final trip, he explored the area around the thick roof of interlaced pine trees. Here, bare spots still existed on the otherwise covered ground. Joe pulled up tufts of dead grass and weeds, and these he forced into his jacket and trousers and boots. The dry materials would add some small insulating quality to his clothing. Two Trees knew that he had now done all possible with the limited resources available. It was time to go back to the wigwam and wait. Joe saw that the snow had already reburied his entrance, and he was forced to dig his way to the flap with bare hands. He noted that snow had drifted over the wigwam, and it now appeared as a small hill. Only the tiny chimney hole, with its blackened sooty ring, showed evidence that this mound was not a rock or beaver lodge. At least the snow would keep out wind. He entered. Two trees took one of his rabbits and skinned it. He cut the meat into pieces and placed them on a small ledge of snow where wind had forced through a crevice in the wall. The crevice was now frozen closed, but it provided a handy spot for cold storage. He did the same with the other rabbit. Joe looked at the few small scraps and wondered. So little was the food made from two plump rabbits. How long would it last? How long would it need to last? He sat by the fire and listened to the storm. The sounds were muffled now by the layer of snow over his hut, but the intensity seemed as great as it had earlier. The blizzard showed little sign of abating. It had blown for a night and a day. Joe was not happy at the prospect of still another night. He wondered if his hastily built hut would withstand the weight of drifted snow above. Unable to do anything further for his protection, he decided that food would help make sleep easier. Soon, two chunks of rabbit sizzled pleasantly over the small fire. The smell of roasting meat was a happy one. It helped raise the spirits of a very frightened young Indian. At some point during the cooking, he noticed that the smell had become stronger. Smoke was burning his eyes. Joe looked up and saw smoke billowed under the roof. The chimney hole had been snowed over. He took a long stick and poked the hole clear. This was to become necessary several more times during the long night. But the meat was done now, and Joe ate. The food warmed his insides as the fire did his wigwam and soon he was cheered by happy thoughts. If the snow stopped soon, there were still ways to find food in the white world. He would make snowshoes of evergreen branches, bent and tied with bark. He would set snares for any animal that might venture out of its hiding place. He could even eat the tiny tree buds, bringers of spring leaves. If the hut held up, he knew he could still find sustenance on the blanketed land. Several times that night the shifting weight caused Joe's framework of saplings to bend or creak, but the green branches, though frozen, were resilient. Some cracked with a sharp sound, but the shelter held. It was morning. Even in the dark of the snow-shrouded hut, he knew it was morning. His body told him. His senses all said morning, but there was no light. He had fallen asleep and now woke with a start. At first he was confused. The cold was no longer waiting to enter his body. It had. His hands and face were numb. His body and feet ached. The fire had gone out. 
Darkness was absolute, unrelieved by the smallest glimmer of light. Joe knew that some light would always penetrate into any snow he had ever known. This was deep snow. He knew he had been buried alive. All around, the snow had reached a height above the waist of a tall man, but Joe's hut was in a spot where it had drifted much higher. He tried to push a stick up through the smoke hole, but his reach was not enough to penetrate the thick mantle. Lashing two sticks together, he tried and failed again. Lighting the fire was out of the question. Smoke would gather, filling the hut. It would quickly choke him. Now was a time for both action and thought. Action came first. He was almost frozen stiff. Joe jumped and rolled. He beat at his arms and body. He twisted and ran in place. After a while, he could feel the cold being pushed out by ex exertion. The sluggish blood began to push through cold veins and reach nearly frozen extremities. Joe was far from warm, but he began to believe he might still survive. Once he was able to use his hands again, he methodically poked his stick through parts of the surrounding walls. He hoped to find a place where the wind had left only thin snow covering the hut. At last, he admitted to himself that there was no such place. The only way out of the trap was the way he had come in, through the entrance. Joe pulled the flap aside and began scooping out a low vestibule. He pushed the snow back toward the rear of his hut. His hands were very cold, but this was his only hope of escape. Thinking of the pouch, which still held his few silver dollars, Joe found it in the dark and used it over one hand as a mitten. The dollars that he spilled out might be lost in the snow, but that didn't seem very important. The hole grew, and finally, he could kneel in a crouch in front of the buried wigwam. By forcing his head and torso upward and then forward, he formed a rough step ahead of him. He dragged more snow down and back into the hut. It became a routine. Dig, push body, dig, push again. The cold was biting and cruel. By now snow had found its way into his boots and down his neck. It melted slowly, sending trickles of ice water down his ribs and between his toes. But Joe had been toughened by a stern father in his early years. Eagle Feather had insisted on winter dippings at the icy creek near Michal, even when Two Trees was still more baby than boy. It will harden him, he had told a worried wife, and so it had. Joe could almost feel the presence of Eagle Feather offering encouragement, urging him on. At one point, Joe felt something in the snow ahead, and his fogged mind, near hysteria, thought it to be the hand of Eagle Feather come to pull him up. It was only the branching limb of a bush that he now recalled was about ten feet away from the hut. He pushed upward and noticed that the interwoven branches had kept snow from packing heavily. Using the branches as foot and hand holds, he forced his way upward. A diffused glow above told Joe that he was near the surface. After what seemed a long time, he was able to push an arm through, opening a small aperture. His eyes hurt at the sudden brightness. His ears picked up the twittering chatter of chickadees high in the pines. Tough little birds that they were, they too had survived the storm. Now they whistled greetings to the newly risen sun. The sound told Joe that the snow had passed. The boy pushed himself through the remaining snow and emerged into a far different world than he had ever seen. Earth had lost her character. Only two colors remained, the blue of the cloudless sky against the endless white of snow. No shape remained to catch the eye only the smooth, rounded contours of drifted snow. 
where trees poked up through the white, they too were covered like pointed tents. Even the boughs of pine were covered and pooled almost flat against the trunks. Joe looked around for the great owl. It appeared to have left. Probably it had gone farther south as soon as the storm allowed flight. The bird knew that game would be very scarce in this wasteland for some time to come. So did Joe. Two trees spent the next several hours improving the entrance. When he was able to pass from the hut below into the open air with relative ease, he cleared the snow from inside and opened his smoke hole again. With a small fire burning, the shelter was soon warm enough to allow him to remove and dry his clothes and boots. When the boots came off, Joe saw something he didn't like. Several toes were bluish black. They felt numb, without sensation. At this point in his story, Joe stopped and removed his boots. The very old man had trouble bending, but he managed to show me that several toes were now gone. I had never noticed this during our trips and adventures, but I saw it clearly that day. I wondered how the amputations of frost-dead toes had been accomplished without aid of a doctor, but didn't ask. I was afraid that I might already know. A flint knife could serve many needs. The old man was visibly weaker, and he asked for water. I gave it to him and held the cup as he drank. I begged him to rest, but he could not. The story, he said, would not be finished if he took time for rest. If he could not tell the story, his spirit would be doomed to walk some shadow place between the floating island and this world. He seemed to need the telling so badly that I had no choice but to listen. I think it was at this point I became aware that my friend, the last Bronx Indian, Joe Two Trees, was dying. He continued the tale telling of drying his clothes and then looking over the surrounding area. The barren snowscape offered little that could be used toward survival. He had lived this long, though. He would continue. Walking was impossible. Each attempted step plunged him in up to his armpits. He broke several pine branches loose and bent them into needle-webbed snowshoes. This done, he was at least able to move around the camp area. He had escaped from his living burial, but he was still trapped. While the prison had been enlarged, the bars were still as strong. He could only manage to move a few yards in any direction. Joe wished fervently that he had found this place earlier in the winter and put up food against such a catastrophe. The remains of one rabbit were his only provisions. By rationing, this might last a week. In that time, other sustenance must be found. Three days passed, but the bitter cold would not allow the snow to melt. Some settling occurred, though, and the movement around the wigwam became a bit easier. On the morning of the fourth day, Joe extended his search area. The need for food had become acute. The Indian crept to the top of a small hillock about a hundred yards away from his wigwam and peered over cautiously. He spotted motion. The tips of the branches of a small apple tree had protruded through the snow and a rabbit was gnawing at the bark and buds. Joe crawled toward the animal, not knowing how he would catch it, but knowing he must. As he approached, Joe was surprised that the furry little creature didn't run off. Finally, the rabbit became aware of man scent and tried to flee, but days without food had weakened it. This wasn't a rabbit from the underground warren. This one had been trapped above by the storm. Half frozen and nearly starved, it was unable to escape from the youth. 
Joe simply crawled over and picked it up. The rabbit, a young female, protested with a few weak kicks, but soon stopped. Joe held her for a moment and then placed her inside his jacket. The rabbit sat quite still, afraid, but warm for the first time in many days. Joe walked back to the shelter with a meal secure inside his coat. The great spirit had provided for him. Once in the hut, he took the furry bundle from against his chest and placed it on the floor. The young hare sat and watched for a long time. She was too weak to flee. There was nowhere, nowhere to go if she could. It was warm and dark here, almost like the burrow she had lost during the blizzard. Joe watched. He saw that the animal was afraid. He began to wonder whether Tichi Manitou had led Joe to the rabbit for food or the rabbit to Joe for shelter. He took a green branch from his pile of firewood and held the butt end, twigs out. The animal accepted and soon was happily nibbling. There would be no roast meat tonight. Joe reasoned that other means still remained to be explored. There were buds to eat. In the morning he would try to capture a trout from the buried brook. He would not kill one who had survived the storm. He would not kill the creature sent by his father for him to protect. Joe broke off more twigs for the animal and returned to the surface. He walked all the way across the grove of pines, following the tracks of Hannock, the gray squirrel. Hannock had not stayed in his safe nest after all. The trail ended abruptly, and the snow told a story, several days old, of the squirrel's last meal before departing. Two small red stains and a few hairs were framed between the imprints of huge wings stretching four feet from tip to tip. The owl would live to find a mate and rear her young when spring came. The simple equation had been fulfilled. Some must die for others to live. It was the great plan. Even as he thought this, Joe worked to gather twigs for his rabbit. Suddenly a thought came. Hannock the squirrel was dead. Joe ran, slipping and falling, to the wigwam. He took off his clumsy snowshoes and looked up at the squirrel's leaf nest. Jumping, he climbed the lowest branch and pulled himself up. Climbing was easy. Each branch offered a hold along the way to the empty nest. He soon reached it and pulled it loose. Its careless owner wouldn't need it again. Joe dropped it to the snow and slid down to the trunk. He picked up the prize and ran to his hut. The small treasures within included seeds, nuts, and acorns, all edible to some degree. Here was at least one meal. The twigs added to the firewood pile. The leaves and soft grass from inside the nest helped Joe's bed become a little warmer. Later, he decided to try for the fish that wintered under the ice on the stream bottom. Joe cleared the snow from over the place where he had seen them days earlier. With a small rock taken from the fire pit, he chipped out a hole in the thick ice. When the hole was wide enough, he looked in, but the noise of chopping had scared the fish off. Two trees covered the hole with a pine bough to keep it from freezing again and left to make a spear. Hickory would be good wood for the spear, but none was available. So Joe cut a long, thin shoot from the apple bush. He trimmed the end to a point and undercut it to form a barb. Taking the green wood to his hut, Joe placed the tip into fire and rotated it slowly. Satisfied that the flames had hardened it enough, he went to the ice hole. By lying on the ice, he was able to peer under one corner of the pine-needled covering and see into the little world below. Winter had come here also. No minnows darted back and forth. No crayfish crept among the pebbles. No insects were to be seen. The stream was asleep. <laughs>
All its tiny residents had retreated into the muddy banks or slept, sheltered under bottom stones. Only the little fishes with spots and a band of color along each side were not gone. Unlike the turtles, frogs, and other stream dwellers, the trout passed his winter without sleeping. He found his place in a deep water spot and rested. Joe could see that several had returned, having forgotten the noise. They were back now, as he had seen them before, slowly finning in the icy current. By inching his spear into the clear water, he was able to slowly bring it near a fish. A sudden thrust and the fish was impaled. Joe carefully withdrew the shiny creature and placed him in snow, away from the hole. He took no chance that his meal might flip its way back into the stream. Before the daylight had begun to fail, three fish were captured. They lay, side by side, frozen hard as wood. The smoke that came from Joe's hut that night had a pleasant aroma. He slept with the warmth of food within him. Late in the flickering darkness of low flames, the rabbit nestled against Joe's leg. He awoke and saw, but did not move. He smiled and went back to sleep. That winter was long and very hard. Joe's toes ached and bled much of the time, but gradually they healed. There was no early thaw that year, and snow covered the land all through the months of long nights. Joe often lost track of the progress toward spring. He would look, on a clear night, to the stars, but they still held their winter positions in the frosty sky. Once he saw the aurora borealis stretched across the northern horizon like a sweeping curtain of light. It was first white, then blue, yellow, green, and red. Joe wondered if it might be a message from his father, but unable to decipher it, he simply enjoyed its beauty. The days and weeks were long. Sometimes the young man wondered if the spring would come at all. Sometimes he would begin to despair. Often he felt warm tears welling in his eyes, and he would force them away. He saw himself as a man now, and knew that Eagle Feather would not have approved of tears from his man-son. Then he would play with the rabbit. The cheery little animal was good to have. Joe talked to it and held it, and the gathering of food for it gave him something to think of beyond his own needs. Then, one day, he noticed something strange. The fear beast that had haunted him during his first winter alone, the winter after he buried his mother, had not come. The horrible loneliness that threatened to destroy all other thoughts was gone. He knew he had felt fear this winter, but it was a good fear. It was the kind that warned one and helped one to be more careful. Fear of hunger, cold, or even of death were kinds of fear that could be understood. They were not the sick fear of loneliness that lived in the shadows and beyond the flap of the wigwam. Joe wondered if the beast still lived somewhere inside him or at his old home place or if he had beaten it. He hoped he had, for more than anything, he dreaded its return. But the beast did not return that winter. The trout became more scarce as time passed. The meals were sometimes very meager. Joe grew thin. Nothing lasts forever, though, and even that winter finally began to die. Warm days came and melted off some snow cover. With the newly uncovered resources, Joe ate better, as did his rabbit. Cold north wind still blew, but the time between the warm days grew shorter and shorter. Spring was coming. Soon the snow was gone and the creek ice began to break and float downstream. The great plan had made one more full circle. Joe felt foolish now as he thought back to his doubts during the bleak days of January and February. The great plan would continue, he now knew, even when he was gone. 
New trout came downstream to replace those Joe had caught. Green shoots appeared along the banks. The rabbit began to spend much time grazing outside the shelter. She watered a little farther each day. At last, she didn't return. Joe was worried, and he walked the area searching for her. He couldn't find her and finally returned to his hut. Joe hoped that she had simply gone back to her own kin and not been found by a hawk or owl. The next day, at sundown, she was back. She stayed the night, but left early the following morning. As the warming days passed, she came less often. Joe began to place her food outside the hut. Sometimes it would be gone, and sometimes not. He would find her accidentally on his daily forays. Occasionally she would allow him to come up and pet her. Usually she shied off. Joe saw that the closeness of two winter comrades was wearing away. He wasn't surprised. It was spring and she wanted her own. She had that right. Then came a time when Joe thought he had lost her forever. He hoped to see her one more time, but the food he put out each evening now stood untouched in the morning. The rabbit was, go the rabbit was gone, returned to the wild. Joe felt happiness at the thought that she was with her own kind, but it was a happiness touched by sorrow. The sorrow passed in the warm weather of April. Joe's days were spent in hunting and fishing gathering and picking. He was weak from long months of confinement and poor diet. He knew that he must strengthen his body with food and rest. When he had done this, he would go on to the coal country. The late spring and early summer brought such bounty to the New Jersey Creek land that Joe was tempted to begin storing for winter. He could stay here and live well. Next spring would be time enough for mining coal. The thought gradually died. Joe was still sure he wanted a place in the white man's society. He gazed off toward a setting sun and wondered what awaited him in Pennsylvania. That night, Joe ate a hearty meal. He could feel that strength had returned to his young body. The foods of summer had put flesh back on his gaunt frame. It was time to leave this place. Even as he thought this, he was sure he would always remember it. There had been the rabbit. There had been the fighting for life and winning. He took dried foods and prepared them for his trip. Later, he put his belongings in a rag and tied them to a stick. He left the small bundle near the flap where he could pick it up as he left at first light. Sleep came quickly. When the first rays of a yet unrisen sun had just begun to color the morning mist to rose, Joe was already awake. He lay for a few minutes to savor the smells and sounds of the newborn day. A bird chirped, and he could picture it stretching small wings, unused for many hours. From far off, the odor of a skunk was carried on the damp air. Some fox had probably learned a hard lesson in the night. Above, a small brown owl hooted its forlorn goodbye to darkness. A splash gave evidence of trout feeding on hatching insects. The day had come. Joe rose and took his bundle. He opened the flap and stood up in the half-light. He looked down and stopped. There were tiny shapes all around his feet, and one larger one. In the dew-wet grass in front of the hut, many small rabbits nibbled, watched over by his winter friend. She had been gone for a purpose, thought the man. Joe reached down, but the furry young scattered. He motioned to the mother, however, and she approached. Hesitantly, at first, then more confidently. She came to the hand that had touched her many times before. 
Two trees knelt in the damp grass for several minutes, caressing his former pet. Then the new mother gathered her children and brought them to a brush pile. When they were safely inside, she turned and watched the Indian. He had also turned toward the west. As he walked, Joe Two Trees looked back and saw the rabbit. He continued on his way again and thought that even though he had saved her from the storm and fed her all winter, it was she that had given the greater gift. 